Hey, we're talking today about the proof that we create, that our thoughts create our own reality. And I have an expert here, Leslie Householder, and she's going to share with you the experiences that she's had on how your thoughts really create your reality and what you can do about it. So join us. How is it we can do some amazing and sometimes unexplainable things? Like heal our own bodies by the power of our thought. Mother's intuition, the law of attraction. Can we really tap into our subconscious mind? Can we really create our own realities? It begs the question, are we novice gods? Hey, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a really fun series and you're gonna love today's episode. We have my friend Leslie Householder who I stumbled across years ago when I was at a place where I was stuck. I, I was trying to change things in my life and I couldn't get over some stuff that just kind of repeatedly coming up and she taught me about how our subconscious thoughts create a reality, create, um, barriers in our lives and she taught me how to get through the terror barrier if you remember you oh, talked yeah. about that anyway i took her course and uh, we've been friends since then and she came in town just to talk to us <laughs> actually she's here speaking but uh we're excited to talk today about how thoughts create our reality so kind of with that what do you think about that leslie i it, it takes me back to when my husband and i first married and then the next seven years that we were struggling so much just to get in front of the money problem. And we just couldn't seem to get in front of it. And the, the same kind of problems kept showing up over and over and over again. Always behind. Always just so close to having things change and then not. Um, job losses, cars that didn't work, medical bills. Just it was, it was really exhausting and depressing. And we had some friends that could see that the way we were thinking and the way we were responding to our challenges was yeah. perpetuating the problem some, and we didn't even know it. Okay. We didn't realize it. And so they started inviting us to come to events that would help us with our mindset, help us think more optimistically, think more positively. And you know, after seven years and a hundred seminars of speakers saying, dream big, picture what you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you got, I got that. But what do I say to the prospect? Yeah, got that, got that. But what do I... How do I organize my time? Yeah, but how do I afford this thing? How do I, you know, I, I was hearing it, but I wasn't hearing it. And finally, uh, we went to an event where a speaker was there and he explained it in a way that was different than I'd heard before. His name was Bob Proctor and maybe you've heard of him. But he helped me understand how my subconscious mind was keeping me in this cycle. Hmm. And on a break at this event, it's really funny, I think back about the moment where I met him for the first time. I, I went up to his booth in, in between sessions at this event, and he had said from the stage that he can tell if a person is, you know, left-brained or right-brained or creative or analytical just by looking at them. I'm like, well, that's, that's a funny little circus trick. Let's see what he has to say. <laughs> so I went to his booth, and I'm standing in line waiting for his assessment. And when it was my turn, I got to the front, and, uh, you know, I'm like, where do you put your hands? What do you, you know, you're being looked at and you're being analyzed. analyzed. And oh, was, don't you hate that? It was, it was <laughs> awkward, but he says, you know, you have a good balance between your right and your left brain, but you're primarily creative. And I remember thinking, okay, he doesn't know what he's talking about yeah. because I am a math major, you know, and I'm always thinking, and I told him this, I said, you know, it's interesting you say that because I'm always thinking, I'm always looking at my situation and I'm processing it, and I'm analyzing it, and I'm picking it apart. I'm always doing that. And he looked at me, and he goes, you're not thinking. Your mind is busy, but you're not thinking. And I'm like, what does that even mean, yeah. you know? And I, I analyzed that for about a year. I'm processing <laughs> it, you know? And what I, what I ultimately learned was that to think is to create. Mm. What I was doing was mind busyness, but it wasn't creating. And so when I told him that I'm always looking at my situation and analyzing it and processing it, because I'm trying to solve my problems by understanding my problem, right? Uh, he knew I was trapped. Hmm. Because to think is to create and to look at what is and constantly process what is keeps you moving towards more of what is. 
And when he explained how to create instead, how to picture the outcome you want, see the end that you intend, picture that first and let yourself feel it as though it's happened. Really what you're doing is you're turning a new idea over to the subconscious mind, which has a way of keeping you safe in what it perceives as safe. And what is so far hasn't killed you, so it thinks that what is is safe, right? Yeah. It's Even the though devil you, don't you know, want it. Yeah. right? And so he said, you, you picture what you want, you see it done, you feel it, and that emotion and that repetition of doing that reprograms your subconscious mind and it hands it a new truth. It says, you have all you need. Life is abundant. The bill was paid, how great that felt. And seeing it done before it's actually happened changes your subconscious program. It gives it a new truth that says, this is my new safe. Mm -hmm. And then subconsciously you're moved to do and say and think and respond differently than you did when you were trapped in this analytical cycle. And my husband and I, when we, when we finally got it and the lights went on, because we'd been hearing pieces of this for seven years, right? We'd been hearing about it. We knew there was something to it. But when we finally had it boiled down to this, how to reprogram your subconscious mind and what to do with fear when you feel it, because um, the cure for fear is not courage. The cure for fear is knowledge. And as we started to gain the right knowledge on how to reprogram our subconscious mind, uh, we came away from that event and tripled our income in three months. And this is after seven years of being so destitute that I'm calling the police on a kid who breaks my broom. You know, and, and I was a school teacher. That was my education. And my husband didn't finish college. And so we were coming from, you know, feeling trapped, feeling like the doors weren't going to be able to open for us to changing our thoughts and having new opportunities show up that never had shown up the way they, they did before we started changing the way we think. That's amazing. <clears throat> and I remember when you told me that, and, and, and actually part of this whole series is now that I've realized, okay, my thoughts create my reality, I've accepted it, but I haven't been able to totally master my thoughts in a way to change my reality the way I want to. And so I keep finding myself in these repeated fail cycles and I'm thinking, what do I need to do in order to really envision something that I want in my life that is obviously not happening right now? So how do I get out of that? How do we create the reality we want when it is obviously not the current reality? So I've been studying this and practicing this and tweaking and testing and experimenting for, we're going on 19 years now. And so I've had a lot of, um, a lot of experiences that taught me how to tweak and fine tune it to where you're building this muscle memory in the way you think mm -hmm. so that your confidence grows and so that you know how to do it again when you need to. Um, but some of the, some of the things that helped me get to that place, and I'm still learning, you know, every, every goal that stretches me out of my comfort zone is as terrifying as the last one. I just have had enough practice to know that that's normal and, and what to do with it, you know, but, um, here's an example. Stories would help me have the courage help me have the faith, the belief to apply it. And I remember uh, there was one time where um, I was struggling to juggle everything that was going on in my family. We were raising seven kids. We were running this business. We were headed into the recession and we were feeling it earlier than most. <laughs> mm. And so that was a lot of fun. But my son came to me, he was a teenager and he's like, mom, can you help me find a job? Okay. That's no small thing. That's not like, okay, I got five minutes, right? Yeah. That could be huge, and it could take a long time. You're teaching him how to overcome his fears. You're teaching him how to do applications and interviews. And I'm like, I don't physically have the time to make that happen. And so I said, let me get back with you just a minute. And I excused him, and then I had a little meltdown. <laughs> and I'm like, how can I do all of this? And then I was reminded of what I'd learned to see it done. And so I imagined my son, it's been, it's been probably 10 years since this happened, but I, I'm pretty sure I, I imagined my son saying, mom, I got this job or something. 
and then relaxing. And when you do this, by the way, it's like turning a, a radio station dial into a different broadcast. Um, and so often when we're in fear, we're down on this frequency and the thoughts we're getting are things like, well, how's that gonna work? That'll never work. What happens if it goes wrong? What happens if we fail? And we're on this broadcast of ideas, but the solution we need is up here. And the solution we need, like a radio broadcast, is already in the room. We just have to tune into it, and we tune into it by seeing it done, feeling it as though it's done, feeling grateful. That gratitude brings mm -hmm. you up, and you tune into this. And the next thought that came to me was get out a journal. It was almost like instructions were given to me. Get out a blank journal, and on one side put what I needed. And then write down what I needed to get out of my head and find peace because I've, I've learned that this process is not so much about how intensely you believe. It's, do you believe it for a moment? Do you feel it for a moment? And then don't doubt. It's the absence of doubt that is the real key. And it took me 10 years of this experimenting to figure that out. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to ask that again. Will you restate that again? Because I feel like this is something I really need to understand. So it's not about how hard you believe it. Mm -mm. It's about, do you believe it enough to put it into action and let the doubt go away? It's how good are you at keeping doubt out? Oh, okay. And, and the doubt will come in. It comes in. And, you, and, and it doesn't kill the seed by having doubt. Mm -hmm. It's how long do you let it stay? And do you know what to do with it to let it go? Because to plant the seed, you see it, you feel it, it's planted. Mm -hmm. And then be unattached to how it happens, be unattached to how soon it happens. We set deadlines for ourselves yeah. to keep us focused. But what do you do when that deadline happens and it didn't show up? How you think in that moment determines whether it's gonna show up at the right time or if you, if you kill it. And so mm. it's just all these little, these mindset um, mastery techniques that keep you so that you are not the limiting factor in what can show up in your life. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Can I tell you what happened with my son and his job? Yeah, yeah, I want to hear that. So I love this because the thought that came to me, remember, I raised my frequency of broadcast, or I don't even know the words to use, but it works. Raised myself up to this place where I had the thought, get out a journal, and I wrote it down. And what he needed, he needed a job, he wanted it to be something that would build muscle, it needed to make a certain amount of money by a certain amount of time, it needed to be... Outside of school, you know, there were some criteria that had to be met. And so I wrote it down. And in my mind, I imagined myself, all right, I believe in unseen help. I just do. I believe that there are unseen forces that help orchestrate the resources we need for us to accomplish our, our intentions. And so in my mind, I'm imagining, I don't know who this help is or what conversations need to happen where, but I'm just turning this over. I, I, I'm turning it over to God. And knowing that I'm not opposed to helping him, I'm just physically unable to do it all. And so I write it down, and then I get back to my work. I saw it done, I felt it, and then I got to peace. I'm like, I'm choosing to believe that there is something happening on his behalf that I can't see. Choosing to believe. 20 minutes later, I get a phone call from my brother-in-law. Hi, Leslie. Hey, is Nathan available this weekend? We're getting a bathroom, I need some muscle and it'll pay him this much money. And it was 20 minutes later, <laughs> and he describes what I had just written down. Wow. And so my this, this special journal I, I started, on the one side I put what I needed, and I would write the date of when I'm making this request. And on the right side I put how he helped, capital H, because I believe in God that helps. Yeah. And so I would write down what happened, and I was just so stunned by this, 20 minutes later, now I don't just put a date on the left, I timestamp it. <laughs> Some things take six months, sometimes, sometimes it takes years. But if I can just be unattached and have faith and trust and do my best to make it happen, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to just expect it all to happen without some effort. But when a goal happens not at the time you want it to, one of the best tricks, one of the best mindset. Uh, tweaks is to look at that and say, I am so grateful it didn't happen yet because it must mean it's not ready and I want it fully developed. Uh, when, when a woman is expecting 
She doesn't get to 40 weeks and say, oh, I guess this baby thing doesn't work. <laughs> in fact, the longer she has to wait, the more expectant she becomes. And so that's, that's, true. that's a switch that I've made in my goal setting. When it doesn't happen when I expected it to, I choose to get more anticipating about it instead of less. And that's a switch. That's a choice. But it keeps you in harmony with these laws that govern all success. I love that. And I hope that helps you with what you're thinking about, whatever your reality is right now, if it's not what you want, and you find yourself in those repeated fail cycles that I have found myself in repeatedly, uh, hopefully this will give you some ideas that you can do to deliberately, consciously make that choice and get yourself where you want to be. What do you think? You've heard our thoughts? Now let's hear yours. In the comment section below, share what impressions came to your mind. What did you get out of this? If you have had thoughts to take action, please do so. Always listen to your inner voice. It's your ultimate guidance system. Of course, the best place to take action is at scottwilhite.com because if you join me for a free web class, I will reward you by sending you my purpose planner so you can have a physical guide to help you get in touch with your inner guide. What if you are a god in the making that would mean there's purpose to your life meaning to your challenges you have a great work to do may you have the courage faith and power to become who you were truly meant to be see you next time